Good afternoon, dear Maverick Insiders. We are very excited to have you with us. Um, and I am honored and happy to introduce you, sort of, because I think you already know, Peter Louis Maybeth, one of my favorite people, um, one of our favorite journalists, someone we are all very excited to listen to. Good afternoon, Peter Louis. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Pauli. Thanks for the warm welcome and good afternoon to all our valued insiders. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this session. Yeah, we would really want to learn from you and see how you unearth all these secrets that keeps us um, edged to our seat. You are obviously the author of Gangster State, telling the story about the ANC's SG Ace Magashule. You, your first book uh, was The Republic of Gupta. Uh, just in time for the Gupta leaks and, and the hype around the Guptas and, and telling the story of how they initiated this parallel state uh, in South Africa. You are also the proud investigator and author of several hard-hitting investigations that quite possibly, um, in my mind at the very least, changed our country's future. So we are here now to chat about and dissect your latest digital vibes uh, and as it circled out towards our former Minister of Health, Zueli Mkize, and what happened to him when you dipped your pen in ink. So I first want to say thank you for your time, and then obviously for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation that made this webinar possible. Thank you for your support. It's invaluable to all of us at Daily Maverick and also to South Africa. And then the Daily Maverick insiders, we love you and we thank you and we stand on tall shoulders and um, we find that with your support, we will always shine a light on the truth. Peter Louis, you, uh, you did a lot of investigation relating to Zueli Mkhizi himself. And as an investigator, I know that in the end, one often finds yourself that you write about 20%, if not 10% of what you actually know. So can you give us mm. insights into this person, um, Zueli Mkhize, this person coming from KwaZulu-Natal, his history there, um, his stranglehold on the politics at the moment, his, um, his good or ambivalent relationship with our current president and how you mm. view him and how you what you unearthed from him? Yeah, Pauli, thanks for that. So Zuelim Kize is a character with a pretty interesting history within the, the ANC ecosystem. Um, it's somebody, of course, who has quite conveniently, you know, before I really go back into the deep past, has hopped around uh, and occupied kind of various positions in terms of the, the broader power set up within the ruling party. Of course, you know, if you go and have a look at the, you know, the, the broad power formations around the Nazare conference, in 2017, you know, at that point in time, I think Nkizi had already kind of started to uh, very subtly drift away from being a core and very like strong Jacob Zuma acolyte, despite the fact that, you know, he'd been in that uh, formation, certainly, you know, coming from KZN and had walked alongside the Zuma uh, faction or grouping uh, for, for those years, especially when he was an MEC in the province, which is where I would really kind of like to take off in terms of looking at Mkhize, you know, as a politician and as an alleged uh, corruptee or beneficiary of corruption. So Mkhize, of course, a medical doctor. Um, he was the longest serving at that point MEC for health, uh, a provincial MEC at that juncture in KZN. Um, that would be in the 90s. But then he, he left that position and became the, the MEC for finance and economic development which, you know, it's a very interesting position. You know, I can draw parallels between uh, what happened under his, you know, tenure in that position in KZN to what occurred in provinces like the Free State. Though those, and provincially speaking, those apartments are pretty um, powerful, um, you know, positions in terms of dispersing with, um, you know, with, with patronage because mm -hmm. they are typically departments that would have oversight over things like ITALA, which is the Development Finance Corporation in KZN. And in the Free State's case, you know, there would be the Free State Development Corporation. So, you know, that, that really puts you at the helm of 
a you know a, a set of entities that that sees a lot of cash flow to you know and spend being directed in favor of patronage networks and cronies as has been the case in those two provinces so minister mckeezes or mc mckeezes at that time our first notable you know question mark next to his name or dark cloud over his head came by the way of the tala scandal which we we seem to forget about pretty quickly collectively in South Africa when he was the MEC for finance his wife Mae Mkize got this very dubious looking loan finance agreement from Itala it's a state funded body that that uh, funds uh, small businesses and farming ventures etc she got that almost 12 million rand loan to buy a farm near Peter Maritzburg and of course as the MEC who controls Itala essentially or the political custodian of that entity of course there would be questions in terms of arms length and you know his supposed or you know would be influence in the decision to extend this this uh, loan to his wife so they already i think that's possibly you know, there there might be some other instances and allegations but that certainly is the the first kind of very prominent alleged corruption or nepotism scandal around minister mkize or mc mkize at that point um and then of course you know he he leaves his position as mc moves into the the anc's leadership leadership structures nationally um you know doing a quick tour through his his political history as a treasurer general of the anc he's also um not uh, unfamiliar with or you know unconnected to a couple of very prominent whispers and some you know more solid reports about uh, corrupt dealings and illicit uh, financial transactions that a treasury general position in my opinion will almost automatically put you in the way of some very curious dealings i mean that is the fundraising arm of the party um the tg would essentially you know head up uh, financing and fundraising campaigns and as we know South Africa or well, the ANC has this very long and checkered history of deriving these financial benefits from companies that get corrupt contracts chancellor house one example there's a myriad of them so uh, in my research mkize popped up in the prosa investigations because um maria gomez who was this kind of very dubious fundraising agent for the ANC that's according to some court papers and liquidation proceedings she had gotten a slice of that toll trains contract a 3 and 1/2 billion rand locomotive tender and that's of course the saga involving former CEO Lucky Montana who then indicated and this is in Sona for David that William Kize was very much on the scene during those years 2014 15 16 when he essentially and full well knowing that this is a very dubious looking contract came with the begging bowl in hand and tried to get his slice or his party slice of that contract when he met with Mario Gomez and Lucky Montana to essentially claw back a portion of that contract for the ANC now you are sketching a picture of a checkered character that um that doubled in um yeah it's a, maybe a bit strong to say corruption because we it's not mm. been put to a court but definitely raised a few red flags and and several red questions so that we uh that we might chastise ourselves for having short memories not remembering um when he started sweet talking the country during the pandemic now i see bob kiran um already know the rules but i want to ask our Maverick insiders to remember that they can ask you any question they'd like and that um this is the time to test your knowledge and learn from you. So and you touched on it briefly but Karen says um the Mkizes was uh, part of the three amigos case it in health department scandal some mm-hmm. years ago and I remember that as being an investigative journalist myself do you mm-hmm. um have one liner that you would want to add to that? Yeah, no, no, certainly. But so that's just another, you know, um, indication of early indications of corruption involving the Mkize family. They, they, these rumors have always swirled. There's been a couple of, um, you know, uh, uh, very detailed reports from other media outlets in those years already, you know, listing the Mkize as beneficiaries of this patronage network in in Kazakhstan. That is another example. I skipped over that. There certainly are quite a couple of others. Um 
And, you know, having yeah, now kind of, you know, honed in on the, the MTZ theme, kind of, you know, you kind of get in touch with, you know, people who have been in the province and in that sphere for quite a couple of years. And there certainly is this, this kind of sense that what, what we know in regard to that is, is only the, the surface and that there's quite a lot more involving this, this patronage network. Um, you know, and I could say without, you know, without implicating anybody in corruption, is it is always a, a problematic dynamic when one half of the the power couple being Dr. the two Dr. Mkizes, May and Johnny Mkize, when one half of them is a um, you know, a self-admitted, you know, business person and mogul and operator, and the other is in politics, th those lines certainly in this instance have become very blurred. And it does seem that, you know, a lot of the, the business dealings on Mayim Kiza's side seems to have been dependent on the political influence and decision making on her husband's side. So that, that definitely is very problematic. Mm, it is a repetitive theme, um, we note, so in South Africa specifically, but yes, indeed, over the world as well. Now, Peter Louis, preparing for this webinar, I've chatted to several people um, in testing their thoughts on Mkise and on what you wrote. And um, bar one person who knew about the Amigos case and about his previous uh, question marks and red flags, everyone told me that they were surprised. They were shocked. And mm. um, to be honest, they, uh, they told me with their with your first story, they were searching for signs that um, Minister Mkhize was guilty, didn't find it and thought, okay, maybe he was just sort of an ancillary, he just had this oversight role, you know, mm. in the words of Ace Magashule, uh, where he wasn't really part of the nuts and bolts of what looked like grand scale corruption in the middle of a pandemic. Mm. Um, do you think they, their surprise is, is valid and, and you know, did you find yourself surprised when you saw the links going to his family? Uh, probably, to be frank, not really. Look, I think I've, I've stopped being surprised <laughs> a couple of years ago. I think they, there's an expectation that the, you know, our foremost political leaders do become embroiled in these kind of scandals. I'm very sorry to, to put that a pessimistic view forward. You know, that certainly is the pattern. Um, and I think it's, you know, we, we do... Perhaps it's a result of the, the absolute deluge of corruption scandals that South Africans have to deal with that we sometimes do forget about earlier, you know, very prominent indications of alleged corruption. When Minister Mkise initially ran what looked to be, you know, very well orchestrated, very, very well handled uh, COVID-19 uh, reaction from the department and on, on behalf of government, it certainly, you know, gave him an opportunity to, in a sense, wash his image and he did become, in, in the view of many South Africans, you know, somebody who embodied a, you know, measured, professional, um, you know, uh, reliable response on behalf of government. And of course, you know, added to that, he is a medical doctor, he's got that credence. So I can, I can in a sense, understand why there's some sort of a, you know, a level of amnesia as regards to, to further dealings, you know. But of course, you know, in, in, I, I suppose as journalists, our skepticism levels are a little bit heightened compared to the general public. So, you know, I knew even then as the praise was being heaped on him that it was this checkered history. You know, there were indications of very dubious looking financial dealings in, involving him and his family. So, you know, the surprise on my side was a little bit, I suppose, less severe than, than on behalf of the Joe public. But it, it should also, I think, hopefully what the public might learn from this is that we we, we also need to keep in mind who powerful political figures and government leaders are and what they pass are, because you know, it's got such a real impact on governance. It, it, this could possibly have been avoided if Minister Mkhize mm -hmm. had never been appointed as health minister in the first place. Um, if, if those who had appointed him had you know, taken cognizance of the fact that there were these question marks uh, behind his name, those weren't taken very seriously. Um, mm -hmm. We're sitting with a police minister now who in his previous role as the commissioner of police was involved in what appeared to be a corrupt property transaction in Pretoria to move the police headquarters to a building owned by Mr. Rusha Bangu, who is very close to, um, you know, to Minister Becky Tsele. So there, there are just these characters who kind of continuously, for some reason, filter into government despite these very dubious track records. 
Yeah, absolutely. And when um, when there are no repercussions and you recycle mm. or play musical chairs with them, this is what you can expect. Mm. Now, your story can easily confuse the reader who doesn't follow the series um, blow by blow like most of, of the journalists do. Can you help us understand the cast of characters, how they fit into each other? Who is Tahira Maida and uh, what did Anban Pele do? And what is the role mm. of Nadira Mita and Radha Hariram? Who are these people and uh, how did they point to Mkize? Yeah, sure. So it is quite a complex web of, web of characters, certainly. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's always going to be easier to kind of focus on Minister Mkize and sort of draw him as the, the central point of this web of characters and we'll, we'll work from there. So what we found, what I found in my research was that um, the the company Digital Vibes was supposedly on paper headed by this individual called Radha Riram. Um, and I'll just quickly, maybe just do a little bit of a, a walk through uh, some of our, our latest, um, or, or actually just a bit of a walk through the investigation from the start. And that will really you know, show us how these individuals are all connected to each other. And just give an idea of you know how we go about investigating these these kind of corrupt dealings. So I don't know if you're, is the screen on your side showing the National Treasury um, database at this point? Yes, we got you there. Great. So this is how I stumbled upon the Digital Vibes scandal, just to be a little bit, um, you know, provide a bit of an insight into how the, the investigations work. There was a, a pretty hefty data set of COVID-19 expenditure released, especially as the expenditure, you know, reached pretty, pretty high levels in late 2020. We finally, from Treasury, got some sort of a you know database of where the COVID nineteen money actually went to. So I was initially not even really looking. I wasn't looking at Zwelim Kize. I wasn't looking at Digital Vibes. I was looking at COVID nineteen expenditure in a pretty broad sense. We published two articles um, back in the latter half of twenty twenty, kind of showcasing. It was more of a data approach. You were kind of showing how the expenditure was being flush to entities that had no business in selling PPE. You know, there was these hundreds of millions and even billions in some departments or collectively going to, to entities that were absolute fly-by nights. So, you know, the, the expenditure databases became, um, you know, larger and larger as departments filtered through the expenditure, uh, expenditure records to National Treasury to account for where the monies went. So I have been looking at this database for, you know, a good couple of, well, now more in excess of a year as um, as soon as this information became available. And at one point I realized that, you know, we'd done some work on, of course, the Gauteng department became quite a central, you know, focus point because of the the corruption scandal involving the, the Masukus, Bandila Masuku, um, and uh, of course the former president, or well, President Thril Ramaphosa spokesperson, in that whole saga. Um, and I noticed that the, the National Department of Health wasn't really um, getting much scrutiny. So I decided to, to have a particularly you know, close examination of what the, the DOH had been spending its money on. So the provinces had, had quite a big budget and they spent most of the money, but certainly the National Department also had a, you know, had, had tallied up quite a big COVID-19 expenditure sum. And it was while researching, you know, their, their cash flows and you know, where the monies went to that I picked up this name Digital Vibes and at that point the, the amount was at 82 million rand which you know considering that it was for communication services it was actually labeled as such it, it seemed pretty high you know I, I'm, I'm not an expert in communications in that field though I wasn't but I started putting out feelers and I asked you know individuals working in that space with a, a campaign like that, you know, where you, you could rack, rack up that kind of expenditure compared to what they, what I could, you know, kind of show to have been the, the COVID-19 projects at that point in time. There, there wasn't very much in the way of radio adverts, television adverts, billboards. So it, it looked like a pretty high amount. So I decided to, to really to hone in on Digital Vibes and have a look at what this company actually was. And it was then that, you know, the, the typical early kind of red flags that we normally identify it involves things like so we'll do a, a thorough examination of um you know who, who the company is and you go and look at the on paper director at least 
Of course, later on, we find out it's a complete front for digital vibes. But um, this lady, Radha Riram, also didn't have any track record in the communications field. You know, so there's these kind of various red flags popping up everywhere. Of course, you know, a red flag is not a, a, um, a, a complete, you know, a set of evidence proving corruption. But red flags, at least, um, you know, allows one to, to kind of make progress on the investigation and draws you into what would later become more compelling evidence of corruption. And one of the earliest things I picked up was the fact that this little company with an 82 million rand COVID-19 communications contract was registered to a residential address in Stanger in KZN. And I thought this was kind of weird that the National Department of Health would appoint this little weird obscure, obscure company um, from Stangert and not maybe in the economic heartland, Gauteng, where the DOH is situated in Pretoria, why they wouldn't contact one of those in a very you know, well-known communications firms with those nice offices in Santon and Rosebank and Pretoria and instead go with this obscure company. I thought that was kind of strange. So I, I decided to check out their, their address you now because I think that it says a lot about these are very sort of superficial you know, remarks about a company, you know, where's it situated, who's the director, you know, do they have any kind of footprint in, in the space that they operate in or for, for which they were now appointed? And it certainly, it didn't look like uh, that was the case. In fact, I, I managed to track down, this was their registered address. Um, I don't know if it's showing on your side now. Um, it certainly, yeah, it, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't to me, you know, I don't know if anybody else has got a different impression, but it doesn't look to me like this is the kind of company that is able to run an 82 million rand COVID-19 communications project. Um, this, of course, you know, we will typically, I'll typically use Google Street View to look at what the company actually physically manifests as, you know, where is it situated? Of course, this is quite dated. This is a Street View from August 2010, but I managed to, I went out there um, at one point too, and I confirmed that this is still just a dilapidated building site that was never completed. So this is Digital Vibes, you know, this is the company, no proper um, offices, no director with a track record in the um, communication sector, anything like that. So the, the red flags really sta uh, stack up. But then I made a big breakthrough. You know, these are just kind of like um, early red flags. The big breakthrough was when I found out that Radha Riram, who supposedly is the director of the company, I got some documentation that listed her as a previous work associate of a lady called Tahira Mafir. And that immediately set off alarm bells because I remembered that name. Um, I was still a journalist at News 24 in 2017 when Zwilim Kize was making this effort or run to become the ANC's president at the end of that year at NASREC. Remember, he was the third way option between Kosozana Ramini Zuma and, and, and Cyril Ramaphosa. And I was at one of the events in Wanderers. And I remembered meeting Tahira Mathur, who was the aide of Zwelim Kiza and somebody who'd been at his side, all journalists in South Africa, especially political journalists, they know Tahira. You know, they, they're familiar with her as having been this person who um, was, was Zwelim Kiza's media person through many, many years. Um, you know, even before that, at, uh, at the ANC, uh, at, at the Tuli House, she was working there with Zweli. So she's a known Zweli Mkizi associate. So that's when really there was a big sort of red flag for me. So now we've got this, the company's from KZN, it just happens to be Zweli's home province. Now there's this connection with Tahira Martha through Radha Riram. They're from, from the same hometown, by the way, in Stanger. So I kind of built up this working theory that, um, uh, that, that Digital Vibes is a front for Tahira Martha. This lady who walked very, very closely to um, Zwelim Kize. And it, it really sort of like snowballed from that point in time. You know, that's where you start to, you know, you make inroads in terms of uh, making contact with sources around that sphere. You know, it's luckily, it's, it's um, you know, they were at Latuli House. So you could start asking people in that kind of environment, you know, what's up with this deal? What's up with Tahira Martha? Are they still working together? You know, so that that really then it sort of starts to stack up. And I think that's when we, we kind of, we published our first story kind of pointing to the fact that actually, you know, I, I managed to be beyond the fact that there's, there's a kind of a link between them that they, you know, been together. 
Tahira Mathur and um, and Radha Arira, you know, that they had some business dealings before. I managed to establish from a source that uh, Tahira Mathur was very much, as far as he understood it, pulling the shots at Digital Vibes, despite the fact that she's not listed anywhere on the company documents. Um, you know, she... She, she was apparently really giving all the instructions for the COVID-19 and NHI work from the, the they had rented offices in, um, in, in Rosebank and they were running the, the show from there. And, and all indications were that Radha Riram was merely a, a front for, um, for, for Tahira Martha. And, you know, yeah, that's, that's kind of like our initial in, you know, that's, that's how we, we first broke the story that, Tahira Martha was a consultant on this project. She was very close to William Kizia. And now this person is essentially getting COVID-19 money because she's a paid contractor or a paid consultant to Digital Vibes. But it, of course, it ended up being so, so much more. You know, we, we eventually, as this thing sort of progressed, we managed to show that there were more William Kizia uh, associates involved at Digital Vibes. There was a young lady who used to work at his foundation in Peter Maritzburg. She was now also working for Digital Vibes. He was another gentleman, Duman Tetwa, um, whose wife worked in Zwelim Kizer's office at Latulia House when he was Treasurer General. She was also, or he was also working at Digital Vibes. So it really became this, the, 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 um, the prevailing image that I got was that Digital Vibes really was this setup made up of Zwelim Kizer people, really. And that, of course, even that, all of that was just the, the beginning of it, because then eventually later we could show that, you know, some of the money actually goes back to William Kizer. Uh, this real web of people placed around him, um, and then one needs to connect all those dots, don't we? So, Nyameka Magongo and uh, Heinrich Durant, I'll come to your questions just now. I just want to take Peter Louis to one point where he describes some of the money flows to us um, and then that will lead us right to your question so i'm going to delay them a bit but peter mm -hmm. louis can you give us a brief breakdown you almost started right there so i think it will will help the flow yep. of telling your story of where all the money had gone um you know including that turkish trip and uh, mm -hmm. all the snake appliances and um everything you found yeah sure so i think the, the old sort of follow the money principle or tenet is, is really um, you know, at the heart of investigative journalism, you know, because that really always shows you, I think that lies at the core of a corruption scandal. You know, if you can, if you can trace and follow the money flows and it actually goes back to one of the principal politicians who had signed off on the deal, you know, that really does kind of complete the circle. So that was always kind of very important to me. And just kind of on that note, unfortunately, you know, it, it's, it's a very difficult endeavor. You, you have to hope that at some point you, in your investigations, you do come across sources or people who kind of can help you in this regard, because of course, financial records are quite difficult to obtain. So thankfully we, we did make a couple of breakthroughs. And I'm just quickly trying to, I'm gonna open a tab here on that question that'll really kind of illustrate the money flows. Um, and, you know, I think broadly speaking, one could probably say that the bulk of this money as things stand now, was definitely diverted from the contract and it ended up in the pockets of Tahira Martha and her family and select other individuals. So I think this is a very important consideration because I think people always sometimes say that, uh, or, or so frequently, you know, people say that there might be some corruption, but you know, at least if there's some service delivery or if there's some value for money, you know, the public can to an extent sort of tolerate that. But in this case, really, it was not true because a, the, the financial flows analysis really shows that a very small fragment, so Digital Vibes got 250, 150 million rand, almost exactly 150 million rand. And it looks like, you know, only about 25 million rand, I think that was the last tally, went to actual things like, you know, COVID-19 awareness campaigns and pamphlets and billboards and things like that. Um, so I think in excess of 100 million rand, was certainly siphoned off to individuals like Tahira Martha to their private accounts, uh, to companies that they had set up by, by all appearances specifically to siphon money off from the contract. And that, that was later proven in SIU filings at the special tribunal. Um, 
actually it, it really sort of then then echoed what what I'd found because they had also confirmed that a large bulk of the money, definitely more than a hundred million rand, went to these kind of very shady looking entities of the Martha family, her daughter, her son, um, Nadira Mita, who was William Kize's former personal assistant. She had set up a company um, that, that also got a good chunk of the money for no apparent reason. So it really does look like um, all out money laundering and corruption, you know, with the purpose of of, of defrauding the public and the dep Department of Health uh, by pretending like this is a COVID-19 and NHI communications um, contract, while in reality it's a scheme to, to flush monies from, from the department. No, indeed. Um, I, I see that um, Zuelin Kize is now challenging the SIU report that you briefly referred to. So let me just mm. refer to my notes here. He says that he's going to file a court case challenging it. Um, and he made a surgeon saying that the findings are unfounded and fair. He made the point of repeating that um, it was uh, the findings were predetermined conclusions on the SIU's behalf. And he offers this quote, he said, it's tainted by stark ir irregularities in the manner in which it conducted its investigation and in its approach to the evidence it gathered. So clearly, on the one hand, um, former minister William Kesey says that the SIU was busy with a witch hunt, that their findings are unlawful and unconstitutional, that they mm. made procedural errors, and that nothing that they found will stand against him and his people. What do you, in your view, having mm. a bird's eye view on everything you've unearthed so far, what would you think about that challenge? And what um, do you think about the quality yeah. of the SIU report? That's an important mm. question to dissect as well. Yeah, definitely. Look, so so I've yeah the these William Kize filings are pretty fresh. I haven't actually seen the um, you know the, the the affidavit or the response yet, but I have read a report on it, and it does seem pretty broad and vague. I don't know if they go into more detail in the actual findings, but it does seem that Minister Kize is challenging the methods um, of the SIU, and I think they're asserting that certain representations that Minister Mkhize or then Minister Mkhize had made to the SIU was somehow ignored and he wasn't given a proper chance to, you know, to, to air his side of the story and that wasn't taken into account. But my, my first and initial, and it's just based on what I've seen on, on that response, is that it seems very broad. You know, it doesn't seem to challenge, um, and that this speaks to the quality of the SIU report with, that I've seen, it doesn't speak to what are very detailed, you know, indications of cash flows of him and his family benefiting from this contract. So, you know, I would love to see more details. I'll, I'll definitely get hold of the latest court filings just to see if, in, in what technical sense, you know, in what detail they challenge the SIU filings. Um, because, you know, I, for a fact, you know, before the SIU's work, you know, I'd, I'd found these indications that money was going back to the Mkhize family. And it, it's very pointed and pretty clear, you know, in, in some instances, you know, we did that story back in... Um, you know, it was a couple of months ago. I don't know if it's sharing on your screen now. You can see that. So showing that, you know, in, in pretty clear detail how the money flows from the contract to help the Mkhize family set up businesses. You know, this is his son, Nedani Mkhize. So, you know, in, in, in answer to one of our other insiders' questions just now in terms of the cash flows, you know, we're not making allegations here. We, we, we have you know, factual proof of transactions that goes from the Department of Health to Digital Vibes and to the, all these various uh, entities, uh, I call them slush funds, that receive monies from Digital Vibes. The monies get forward to kind of third tier slush funds and they land in the accounts of the Darnium Kize, for instance. Um, and this then goes to help them set up businesses like a hair salon in KwaZulu-Natal. A second example of this is um, Minister Mkhize's, apologies if I keep on saying Minister Mkhize, it's an old habit, former Minister Mkhize, um, his daughter-in-law got a chunk of the money to help her set up a very nice upmarket nail boutique um, in, in KwaZulu-Natal. And again, you know, these, these transactions, and I go into more detail in this particular article, insiders can go have a look, 
these transactions kind of typically happen within days of one another, sometimes within hours. Um, the money goes from the department to Digital Vibes. It forwards money to Mateta Projects. That's one of, one of the more prominent slush funds in this in this uh, scheme. And Mateta then pays for literally uh, Minister Mkhize's daughter-in-law's business. Um, this was a payment for a contractor that had helped to go and do the shop fitting and things like that, and some some um, some furniture and things at the Tammy Taylor branch in in Midlands for Stockholm Mkhize's. So. There's very real, you know, this is just one example. Our latest uh, expose, of course, showed that monies goes towards Maim Kizes Itala loan account. So she's got this loan I'd mentioned earlier uh, through, through which her company, Cedar Falls, bought a farm um, in, in Peter Maritzburg. You know, this, this loan is still alive. It's not been paid off yet. So money goes from the department to Digital Vibes to all these slush funds. And then some of it gets used literally to help her pay off um, the farm loan. It's an amount of 1.88 million rand. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd once again, I'd, I'd really be curious. I'm, I'll definitely peruse these documents pretty soon. I'd, I'd like to see what their response is in terms of these very detailed cash flows going to the Mkiza family. Mm, we're all looking forward to your analysis of that. But I have a question twofold. One is my, my own question, and the second is based on Heinrich Diran's question. So I want to ask you, you've shown us now the money flows that, as you have it and as you understand it. And you say and you, you name some of the documents that you base it on. Some of them are bank statements or documents that you received. But Peter Louis, we didn't see it. Um, we have to trust you mm. that they are real and that it's... Um, uh, that it's documents that's um, that that's official um, and that can be submitted to court. Hmm. Now, I want you to help me. Do you think, uh, no, let me rephrase that. Is it is it possible that you perhaps made a mistake and that you accused hmm. the wrong man here of perhaps corruption and all sorts of nefarious dealings and that it, um, that the money didn't go to his family, but that, for example, someone framed him and offered you documents that's invalid and maybe made up and mm. that leads us into a question that Heinrich posed saying that you know there are a lot of financial institutions private banks um they sh they should be the watchdog here um mm. what are what are their role then in these dealings as well when um when you get us to a point where you can tell us no we should trust you and that these are official documents that can be submitted to court? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good question. Um, you know, I think, so fortunately in this instance, um, the majority of these findings have been mirrored in the SIU filings. So these are at the special tribunal currently playing out. Uh, once they get filed, they become public documents. It works like a court of law. So any, any skeptical South African is welcome to go and draw the SIU filings at the special investigating, uh, at the special tribunal uh, where they will see that these very cash flows that I've um, described now, not all of them yet, actually. Um, the SIU doesn't, hasn't really gone into all of the payments to, um, to the Danium Keys. I think there's a couple of outstanding, but the majority of them are now find bearing in the, the SIU findings. So they've gone and with their resources and capabilities and, and subpoena powers, They've got and confirmed that money goes from the Department of Health to the Mkhize family. Um, and why we would also, um, you know, we can we can assume they are true. A second reason is the Mkhize family don't deny it. So the Dani Mkhize has admitted that he took money from Tahira Mathur. Um, the, the 300,000 rand payment that we had unmasked back in April or May or something, he admitted that he got the money from her, but... Of course, where, where there's a divergence in narratives is where they offer different reasons for it. So he said back in the day that he was merely a friend of Tahira Mathur by virtue, I suppose, of his dad's connection to her and that the money was just a gift and that she regularly gifts him money. That's the word that he used. Um, so there, there's an admittance. I think it's one that, that possibly legally, as a lawyer, I wouldn't have advised him to to go and do what they have done and admit that they took the money, but they admit that they took the money. Um, Zweli Mkhize admits 
that there were refurbishment works done at his property in Bryanston. Um, and that is following our investigation on that matter, one of our earliest cash flows. In fact, the first cash flow link that we find to this deal was this small co comparatively payment of 6,000 Rand to, uh, to, to, to do minor upgrade works at a property that Zerim Kieser owns through a trust in Bryanston. And he admits that that happened. He just offers a very different narrative a, 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 around it. He says that um, he was not privy to who was paying for it. Um, it somehow happened because his the caretaker of that property was somehow connected to Digital Vibes. I don't know. And then the invoice landed with them and they paid for it for some reason. So there's an admission on behalf of the Mkise family that they take money that stems from the DOH contract to Digital Vibes. They just kind of give different reasons for it mm. um so yeah now there's a very strong a growingly strong body of evidence really that that kind of firms this up so what you're telling us is um the mckeezes themselves admitted to wrongful money flows but they also disagree that they were wrong they disagree that they um through nefarious and corrupt and fraudulent ways received the money so 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 i guess that's it then we don't we can't label them being corrupt and fraudulent payments and therefore the mckeezes aren't corrupt yeah look so that that is their stance but it's certainly one that i very strongly disagree with kind of having been privy to these cash flows um and and the cash up and the uh, the, the decisions that that kind of went before them um you know the the line of uh developments are pretty simple you know there's a minister who played a very real role in ensuring that a contract is awarded to Digital Vibes. So that was confirmed by the SIU. So Zulim Kize, despite the fact that a, a minister isn't really supposed to get involved in procurement decisions, um, he advocated for the appointment of Digital Vibes. Um, Digital Vibes is then secretly run by the person who was his very close aide for many, many years, Tahira Mafir, in the background. The SIU calls in a fronting situation in its filings. I mean, she calls the shots, and obviously there's a paper trail around this. Um, Zwilim Kizes PA Nadira Mita just happens to be the person who procured the lease agreement for where they eventually operated their offices, things like that. So that's uh, the kind of the beginning of the, or the, the, uh, the first half of the developments. But then later on, after all of these dealings, when the contract gets awarded, when the Simkize gets money from the contract, so it'll be up to a court of law, I suppose, to decide whether this looks like the payment of a kickback to McKeezy and his family. And the, the quantum is getting pretty big. I mean, I think the last time we tallied the total of payments, it's, it's now close to 9 million rand. If you look at the, remember, there was a bucky that was bought for Zerim Kizeh's son, Ledani. The payments to those businesses I'd mentioned, the nail salon and the hair salon, uh, cash payments. Uh, the 1.8 million rand that went to Mayim Kizer's Iktala loan. So it really is heaping up. And I suppose, you know, um, it's it's up to the public too uh, to decide whether they think it's all coincidence that monies from Digital Vibes goes back to the Kizer family <laughs> or whether this is corruption. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty convinced on my side. But yeah, I suppose everybody's got a different reading on these kind of things. Okay, let's talk repercussions, Peter Lee, um, uh, about former Minister Mkhize. Um Our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, seemed to dither on him when the SIU report was released. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so we, now we kind of move into the, the realm of politics, which is normally, it's, it's interesting to me, but I, I do kind of enjoy limiting myself to the, the strict forensic findings of these cash flows. But I think definitely, you know, if, if I had to broadly speak to it, you know, or in my opinion, I think the entire handling from Ramaphosa's side was disappointing. Um, I think he, he sat on that report for way too long. He definitely had an opportunity, opportunity to earlier take the public into his confidence and share the SIE's findings, which were pretty damning. Um, he chose to kind of dither by all appearances. His reason is that they, you know, they took quite a, it took quite a long time to get the third party consent uh, for the report to be released, but in my opinion, it shouldn't have taken that long. But I think kind of the, the overwhelming 
take out for me as far as Ramaphosa's handling of the affair is um, kind of centers around recent developments when um, Ramaphosa, despite having been privy to all of this, you know, the fact that, you know, in a pandemic, you know, these monies are siphoned off to help pay for things like his salons of the minister's family, he still chose to say that Nkiza had served the country well. So I think politically, there was a missed opportunity to come out very strongly and speak out and condemn, censure um, Zulim Kize for what he had done and to very harshly, um, you know, uh, condemn Kize's corrupt conduct or allegedly corrupt conduct. But instead, Kize, in my opinion, for, for the sake of political expediency, because of these internal eruptions and turmoil in the party, went with the... Um, the more the softer approach and said that despite the digital vibe scandal, Nkiza had served the country well and that we should essentially kind of bury the matter now and kind of move on. I think politically for me, as, as a leader who had come into power on a anti-corruption ticket, um, who supposedly is leading this alleged new dawn anti-corruption movement, that was a very disappointing mo a moment and one where for me personally, our, our current president uh, lost face, uh, lost lost my respect, um, and he clearly is a, a two-faced liar when it comes to his supposed commitment to rooting out corruption, while in the same breath he still condones corruption and supports people who very clearly become involved in corruption. So it's Ramaphosa done, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. You're moving right into Nyameka uh, or Nyameko Magongo's question there, who says, or asks rather, um, in the context of the corrupt and dubious dealings by politicians in our country, should he be anxious about our president? Yes, I think so. I think uh, just like uh, if, you, if you want to frame it around the, um, the handling of and the stance towards corruption and the willingness to to speak out against him, it, even though it might be politically uncomfortable or cause ructions internally, um, I, th I am concerned, certainly. Um, I don't think there, there was one evening when there was a parliamentary session and, oh no, it was one of the rare occasions when um, President Ramaphosa faced a gallery of journalists and he essentially said that we need to move on from the, daily, from the, from the digital vibe scandal. Um, and you know, that, 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 that doesn't um, illustrate to me that it's a president who takes corruption seriously when it's kind of shown to be prevalent within his cab cabinet or amongst, um, you know, ANC members and senior leaders around him. Mm, and KwaZulu-Natal leaders, obviously, that will help him in the coming elections. Um, let's move you away from politics and back to the facts and talk again about repercussions. We didn't touch on Anban Pele as I wanted us mm. to. So could you tell us the SIU report seems to, in my mind, on my mm. reading, making him the fall guy. I want to test that with you and I want to, in one sentence, tell us who is Anban Pele again? Yeah, so Anman Pillay was the acting DG at that point in time. So we have to keep in mind, just going back, the, the Digital Vibes contract was already awarded pre-COVID in late 2019. Um, it was a national health insurance awareness contract. So it was going to be a communication scheme to inform South Africans of, about this pending NHI program that was coming along. And that then morphed into a, a COVID-19 project in around late uh, March 2020, of course, because of the pandemic. So Anban Pele was the, the acting director general um, when this contract was awarded to Digital Vibes. So the reason, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit loath to use the word scapegoat. They've, they've certainly very, you know, staunchly um, honed in on his role in the saga, definitely, but he's not the only one. But as the acting DG, um, he, he played a very instrumental role in ensuring that Digital Vibes got the contract. Uh, we have to keep in mind also it's it's not a um, it's not a very sound contract process even before all the dubious cash flows it's been found to have been irregular by the auditor general there was no open tender process there was all these kind of shady dealings happening in the background to to allow essentially digital vibes to come in and get the contract without a proper procurement process in the first place so it does look like an unlawful or irregular tender in any case and mm -hmm. and Anban Pele was kind of very instrumental in all of that as the DG. You know, he would have uh, motivated 
to national treasury, for instance, for why the DOH needed to deviate from standard procurement processes and why Digital Vise was, this, was a suited company and why they were best equipped to to deal with this uh, with this contract. Um, so I think yeah, that that's kind of the reason why he's he's been so prominently pushed forward as as one of the central characters by the the SIU. I'm wondering, Peter Louis, because the SIU, again, on my reading, I might be completely wrong, was um, fairly light on former Minister Mkise. Do you, would you agree or do you completely hmm. disagree? Um, because I think that Pele's role was highlighted quite a lot, but I heard very little hmm. about what I thought Mkise should have, should have received more of a spotlight. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I think you, you're right to that uh, um, in, in, in that sense. I think that might have been because at the at the juncture that the SIU submitted the report to the president, they they haven't wrapped up the the ongoing investigations that are now unfolding at the special uh, tribunal. So there there are still filings at the special tribunal that have been made subsequent to the conclusion of the SIU report handed to the president. So yeah, so we have to keep in mind there's kind of these kind of two pillared um, process unfolding now. There's the SIU report, that's the report that gets handed to President Cyril Ramaphosa. And then there's ongoing civil litigation at the special tribunal through, through which they're trying to claw back all of these monies from, from the individuals who got them supposedly illicitly. And I think possibly, you know, I think maybe at, at the at the point in which the report had to be concluded, which which kind of dealt more with the procedural aspects of awarding the contract to Digital Vibes in 2019, you know, the tender decisions, the um, the bid committee decision that that flawed process through which digital vibes was appointed um you know the, the report seemed to have focused more on that as opposed to the cash flows which was only firmed up after the fact um and i think you know possibly the siu could have been um had they been privy to that information i suppose at that point it may have come out a little bit harder um but it definitely when one is always concerned when you know a dg instead of the minister uh, is, is kind of, you know, pushed in into the spotlight to that degree. So mm. yeah, I think there, there, there's Bela, probably some reason to be concerned over it. Yeah, sure. Bela Tumbadu asks, why would Treasury allow Pele the deviation? So they actually didn't. Uh, so National Treasury, uh, the, the DOH requested a deviation from the process. And National, National Treasury wrote back to them and said, uh, they, they claim that there were some time constraints that um, the national cabinet had finally given the green light on the national health insurance and that the DOH now very quickly needed to roll out this communications project. So that, that was kind of their, one of their reasons for it. And the national treasury wrote back and said, no, you can't just go and award a contract to, to one company. In the very least, what you have to do is you've got to... Um, put out a limited request for propo proposals, uh, RFQs, um, or RFPs to at least 10 companies. And this is where things get very, very shady. So the SIU found that the, um, the DOH did a, a very sort of fraudulent looking box ticking exercise by inviting companies to bid for it. But some of these companies didn't even receive the, the, um, the, the, the invitation to bid. Which is why ultimately only two companies bid for the contract. So Digital Vibes and another company that actually has an office that is not a half built house in Santon. Um, and this company came in at half of the, the contract price of Digital Vibes. And they were still uh, pushed aside and not chosen to deliver the service. So National Treasury made some inputs and they were uh, very stern as regards how the, the tender process had to unfold. The DOH simply sidestepped um, the NHI, uh, the, the, the National Treasury instructions, and went ahead with a very dubious looking procurement process. Hmm. Uh, back to repercussions again. Anwar Mal asks whether we will ever recover the money from Martha and her cohorts. Look, I think I think some of it, definitely. And I think this is in one instance, you know, this digital vibe saga is one instance that we can partly celebrate in terms of accountability. Um, I can, we can report that you know, some of the money has actually been paid back already. So some of the alleged slush funds that I pointed out earlier, for instance, Mateta projects that got about 10 million rand of this money, um, they've paid back that money. That is in an SIU trust account now. 
Um, and I'm, I'm certain that where some of these monies are still in accounts and haven't been flushed out or spent on Gucci clothing or you know other such things, um, the the SIU certainly would be able to claw back quite a quite a good chunk of the money at least. Yeah. Mm. I have two questions for you before we run out of time. One is my own and one is Mary Carlisle's. So my my question is, do you have more? Can we expect some more information and um, uh, new secrets on the digital vibe scandal? Um, yeah, look, I think that the digital vibe scandal would certainly, you know, possibly still reveal a couple of surprises. Um, you know, I, I definitely haven't seen, um, I, I kind of always try and, you know, tell myself that I want to see every last random cent in its ultimate destination, which is, of mm -hmm. course, nearly impossible. You know, but that, that definitely is the goal. You want to see as much as uh, the end destinations of as much of the money, at least. Now, I'm not I'm not satisfied that I have seen uh, where all of the money went to yet, um, especially if you look at the structure of how the cash flows, you know, these first, second, third, fourth year recipients, and then they disperse it on to even more people kind of want to see if, if other individuals also got some of the money. Um, so I'll definitely keep on looking at that. But I think kind of more broadly speaking, and, and perhaps here we might see some uh, some results in the near future. I'm, I'm not concerned about what happened at the Department of Health when Zerlim Kize took over in terms of other contracts. The Zero Vibes is one small little contract in a government department that has one of the biggest budgets in South Africa. Um, it's a, a big spending department. And mm. I now want to see if, if this is his approach to the handling of a government um, department. Now, we have to keep in mind also, you know, he was at COGTA before, and then Digital Vibes just happened to get a contract there, and then they got one from from uh, the DOH2, another red flag that I failed to mention earlier on. So I, I'd like to know what else is there, what, what else is hiding in the Department of Health Finances during that period when he was the Minister of Health. Um, what other kind of contracts? Who got what? Is there any any other digital vibes is that we, we don't even know about yet for a whole range of other services? You know, it could be from, you know, other COVID-19 gear, um, you know, lease agreements, those kind of things. Keep an, mm. keep an eye on it. We're looking forward to it. So last question, Mary Carla wants to know, how can South Africans help you to support the invaluable work you do on behalf of our country? Mary, that is an excellent question. Um, so I'm, I'm sure uh, being a Daily Maverick insider, you would know this already, but investigations cost money. Yeah, so we, we definitely, I had to do a couple of cross-country trips for this investigation, you know, I had to fly out to various places. So we, we do need to be supported financially, you know, that's the long and the short of it. So the more contributions we can get from Daily Maverick insiders, you know, other South Africans, um, the more diligent and the more thorough our work can be and the more time and resources we can devote to, you know, the, these uh, government contracts. So definitely that is, I would say, the foremost manner in which we, we can be supported in our work. Mm. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time to help us and to educate us and to tell us a little bit more about those behind the scenes stories of yours that we will never know of if you don't share your secrets to us. So thank you to you. Um, 